Good evening to all our participants. Uh, I'm Rudrakshi Shetty, the moderator of this session, and I warmly welcome you all to our online webinar on Unlocking Your Research Pot Potential, an initiative by ThinkMed. If you don't already know about our organization, our organization is led by students who are passionate about medicine and healthcare. We come from diverse backgrounds, ranging from pre-med students to those studying about public health, nursing, and other fields. But we all have only one motive, that is, to explore our interests and develop our skills while making a positive impact on our community. We organize various events and activities, quizzes and competitions, workshops such as this one, to promote health awareness and provide resources to those in need. So whether you are a student interested in healthcare or simply looking to make a difference, we warmly welcome you all to join us in our mission. And today through the session, I'm very proud and fortunate to announce that we have our speaker, Mr. Vinay Suresh. Uh, before I start talking or get into his credentials, uh, let me start by congratulating Sir for his acceptance for the World Federation of Neurology grant, where Sir will be presenting two of his studies in Montreal, Canada. Hearties, congratulations to you, Sir. Uh, it is such a considerable accomplishment at a student level particularly, uh, and therefore we are so fortunate to have you here uh, to share your journey with us today. And uh, speaking a little bit more about Sir, uh, he has 10 publications in PubMed Index journals and five abstracts published in reputed society journals, along with two meta-analyses registered in Prospero as first author. He has 12 acceptances for his presentations in internationally reputed conferences. He has been selected for medical students research training at CSIR CCMB and developing Indian physician scientists at JIPMO. And he has also represented India as an international ambassador at the Neurology and Neurosurgery Interest Group. He has received numerous research and travel grants, such as ISASS 22 Young Research Grant, and last but not the least, to tie everything together, he's also the founder of Research Peer Alliance. If I were to talk about Sir, I don't think an hour would suffice. Uh, so I'll hand over the platform to you. Please take over. Thank you so much and welcome again. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Rudrakshi, and uh, thank you, uh, ThinkMed, for inviting me. You guys are doing an amazing job. Am I audible? Can you confirm once, Rudrakshi? Yes, sir. Okay. Yeah. So I would be talking about uh, research today, unlocking your research potential, master the art of publishing uh, outstanding papers. Now, what I'll be covering today would be uh, first, why should we do research, especially as uh, people who are in the medical community as uh, students who will be becoming clinicians further. Why should we do research? Uh, how to start and what skills do you need and I'll I'd, li I'd like to share some uh, important insights from my end as well so coming to why we should do research uh, so I'll be sharing my two cents because uh, so this is what I tell everyone who approaches me as to why why should we do research why am I doing so much research why are people doing so much research it's because it's as, it's as simple as this um, so I, I believe most of our audience are medical students so we'll end up becoming uh, doctors, we'll uh, we'll join hospitals, we'll join government hospitals, we'll have our private practice, and in, at the end of the day, we treat patients. And uh, at most, what we do is we extend the patient's life or we improve their quality of life. But fifty to hundred years down the lane, the patients are no more, we are no more, and uh, we don't have uh, anything to talk about. The generations don't have anything to talk about us or our name. So, research is one way where you can stamp your name in history because whatever work you do, it gets published. These are electronic databases and they're here to stay for hundreds of years and your work uh, will be associated with your name forever. Uh, I believe that's the most, uh, uh, I mean, that's, that's, that's a very highly motivating factor actually. And of course, the other reasons are there. Uh, we'll have to, I mean, we all are scientifically curious. We want to pro uh, contribute to scientific progress. And uh, also research helps us to become a better the clinician. Now, there are no stats to prove this. Uh, there, there was one editorial that was published in The Lancet, I think, in uh, 1994. Um, the name of the editorial is, Does Research Make Better Doctors? Uh, there were a lot of responses to this editorial, actually, as I was reading. But one general consensus which we can draw from that is that uh, all doctors should have good training in critical appraisal of research, uh, as quoted by St Stephen Evans. Now, what this means is that I feel uh, all of us to, should at least understand what is research, if not do it, so that we'll be able to differentiate what is good and bad research and we'll be able to incorporate it in our practice. 
so moving on to how to actually start now whenever someone ask me how do i start research uh, i am not one of those people who uh, would introduce you to a research paper and be in a project and that's how you learn of course involving in a research project will help you it will give you first hand experience but you know developing the skills comes first for me and the most important skill is to actually improve your language uh, specifically english because that's the primary language used in research the fluency grammar technical and scientific writing skills it's the one of the most important if not the most important skill to develop actually and then vocabulary of course so remember that uh, this is an acquired skill it's not inherent right uh, many of us i mean many people who i meet they don't have uh, english as their first language they have been taught different languages throughout our school they come from different backgrounds but it doesn't really matter you know it's it's something that's acquired and it can be developed with time provided you put in the efforts uh, and the time that's required now uh, some of the few effective strategies that i feel uh, you can use is to make it a habit to read research papers and also to understand the technical language used so uh, this is a paper that was uh, written by vikas singh and this is what they quote actually it has a lot of meaning the first step in this process is extensive and attentive reading in order to gain an overview of the published liter literature and also to acknowledge the structure and style of research articles it is here during this stage that many students do not invest sufficient time to read enough so as to gain a sound grasp of literature now this is the issue actually so many people uh, they are interested in research that's that's amazing that's the first step of course but then after that i feel the first skill that you need to develop is extensive reading which will translate to improvement in language and fluency they have different languages uh, Uh, as their first language while learning in school and when they when they come across uh, the literature when it when they come across scientific uh, technical writing that is that's, that's used uh, that english that's used in research they have this mental barrier that you know it's difficult to understand i don't understand so you have to remove this without removing this you can't proceed actually then i'll be moving on to uh, describing what's the structure of a research paper i think uh, you have a lot to gain so like we are uh, all all aware that uh, introduction or background is the first section followed by methodology results and discussion this kind of varies depending on the study type but each section has its own distinct style and purpose uh, and it serves a specific function within the research paper so what i'll do is i'll break down each of these sections so that you'll understand okay how this slide um so coming to the introduction as uh, it's self explanatory you briefly introduce the topic and it must be relevant but Uh, the purpose of writing an introduction or background is to convey uh, the purpose of writing the paper as well right because see most of the people who actually end up reading your paper uh, will be the academia the people who are actually aware uh, to some extent of what you're actually what you have written about already so we don't want to be lectured by reading your introduction we just want to get a, an idea uh, as to what you're right you're writing in that paper that's it so you need to also convey the purpose of writing the paper because most likely you'll be writing about something uh, that's rare uh the, so you need to mention the rarity of the condition or you need to mention the gap in literature uh that you're trying to fill and of course uh most likely or not uh, you your study has something to add it has uh, substantial implications that you would like to mention so this is a, a paper that i had uh, authored and this is one of the most important points which i feel uh, is sometimes missing even in a really good studies you need to mention what you're writing uh, i mean what you're reporting uh what your study intends to do in the last few lines of the uh, introduction so like uh, you can see here i have highlighted that uh, in light of limited evidence in the given context we conducted this study to investigate the phenomenon of immune dysregulation in cases with sspa so it, we clearly are uh, describing what our study intends to do so this is a crucial uh, part it's a crucial component of the introduction which you shouldn't miss, miss. and you need to be crisp and to the point uh, you shouldn't be vague or non specific and also always remember you need to i i can't stress up on this enough you need to make an outline you can't miss it because outline gives a flow and structure to the paper and um, i'll show you an example of how an outline is made uh, in the next slide so let's say i'll just give an example let's say your paper is about neoplastic meningitis so you shouldn't be having uh, sections or paragraphs explaining what is a neoplasm right that's that's irrelevant uh, your topic is neoplastic meningitis you can as well start with it do not have lengthy write ups on let's say infectious meningitis it's totally irrelevant 
instead your outline should look something like this what is neoplastic meningitis uh, its burden the prevalence incidence uh, basically the epidemiology and what is already known about the topic uh, clinical features a word on the diagnosis the prognosis and what uh, our study intends to do uh, or what your review intends to do so the last component is something i already iterated before it's called occupying the niche uh, it comes under the swales cars model i'll explain about it later so this is another meta analysis that i had authored and um, you can see the different components of the introduction which i just mentioned uh, so initially we introduce what it is the global burden the epidemiology and uh, the known information or, which is already published in literature regarding it and in the end you can see uh, we have written that hence we sought to conduct a meta analysis to evaluate the clinical outcomes post stroke and post stroke intervention so we clearly are describing what we intend to do right so that's how an introduction sh should end ideally you shouldn't miss that now uh, this is the swale scars model uh, it's used for writing the introduction um it has three moves that an author can actually uh, do establishing a territory establishing a niche and occupying the niche so it's quite self explanatory you can read up the entire model and what i explained before is basically the same thing coming to methodology it differs according to the study type of course depends on whether you're writing an original study or a review so you have different subheadings under that but there are certain key elements that you shouldn't miss and uh, methodology is that section it's what i like to call the sweet spot of any paper because it it actually explains how much the authors actually understand research right this uh, how, the rigor of the paper is actually uh, shown in the methodology so here are some uh, uh, here are some clear key elements that i feel should be there in any research paper you should mention the study design it's very important whether it's prospective or retrospective in nature whether it's cohort how many arms are there uh, is it a case control study uh, how are the controls matched is it a cross sectional study and the sample size inclusion exclusion criteria whether it's with respect to subjects or articles if it's a review data collection methods data analysis so basically need to be as detailed as possible in the methodology and the more detailed you are the um, more evidence you'll be end, uh, ending up adding your paper will end up adding and also when you submit to any journal right the peer reviewers they get a rough idea they get a clear idea in fact as to how, what's the strength of the study what's the quality of the study by just reading the methodology and of course you need to include figures and flow diagrams uh, if applicable we have the prisma flow charts for systematic reviews but even if it's a narrative review consider dropping in i mean uh, synthesizing a flow diagram coming to the discussion so discussion is one section that really tests the writing skills of a researcher many people really even to this date many researchers also don't understand how a discussion section is actually written so this general outline that i prepared uh it is it, it would suffice actually for any discussion section that you would want to write so uh, i would suggest you guys to maybe screenshot this and refer to it in future if you're writing the discussion section so the first thing that you would want to start off in the discussion section is to review or restate your study's findings um and then after that you would interpret the results of your study what do they mean like in results section all you do is you just uh, report the numbers you report the 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 results of your analysis different statistical tests that you have used but then what do the, what do all those numbers mean you need to interpret that here right not copy pasting the uh, the results but what does it mean right and then after that you try to draw comparisons with uh, similar studies in literature and of course uh, whatever uh, you conclude from the findings of your paper they have clinical implications uh, so you need to mention what implications they have and do do not forget to critically appraise Uh, and iterate the limitations of your study every study has limitation no study is perfect and you know the more clearly you describe them uh, it looks good it reflects good on the authors actually because you know that reflects the originality of your paper and also how much you understand research and of course and then the conclusion and highlights you need to always end the discussion if there's no specific conclusion section you need to end the discussion summarizing the key findings and highlighting what your paper actually has to add to literature so please note that while you write uh, research papers uh, it's not about paraphrasing other papers uh, paraphrasing is something that many uh, researchers do i have seen many people just read 
one or two papers, they read reviews and they feel like, okay, we can write our paper. They copy paste huge chunks of those papers and then they just try to paraphrase them. They use different AI, maybe, I mean, they use, uh, they paraphrase it and it doesn't look good because uh, that's not how a research paper is written. How it's ideally written is you need to read multiple papers on the topic. Take your time, devote some amount of time every single day to um, the topic that you're writing about and understand the subject well. Get an overall understanding of the subject because see, at this stage, we are not experts in the field, right? You're a medical student. Uh, so this is something you'll have to do before you write uh, any research paper. It's, it's something like a responsibility actually. And then after that, you build a no knowledge core in your mind. And then you draft an outline, like I mentioned. So you draft an outline and you expand on it. You consolidate all the paragraphs and then you review and improvise on the quality. So this is how you write any research paper. Uh, this is the structure or the anatomy of a research paper. Uh, it, it was written by, I mean, this figure I found in um, a book written by Taylor Burroughs. I would suggest you guys to read it. It's a brilliant book on uh, how you should be writing research articles for publication. It contains the components of uh, a research paper, which I basically described uh, in my previous slides. And these are some other uh, readings, which I would suggest you uh, to read. There's this book by Albert Tim, Winning the Publications Game, uh, the smart way to write your paper and get it published. It's an excellent book. Actually, it provides practical advice on how to craft uh, a well-structured paper. And also uh, certain common pitfalls to avoid, such as uh, plagiarism and poor citation practices. So plagiarism, uh, I'd like to add a couple of points on that. So plagiarism isn't an issue at all if you actually follow uh, the, the research methods you're supposed to follow uh, honestly. Because if you read enough papers, if you write a paper on your own, if you make an outline and you know you write the paper the way it's supposed to practice uh, good writing practices. And there's this other paper uh, by Elena D. Kalistinova. Uh, it's uh, on how to write your first, first research paper. I think this uh, paper is published in the Yale uh, Journal of uh, Biology and uh, Medicine. It's an excellent paper that uh, it describes the outline of how a paper uh, is written. And uh, it describes a few questions you need to answer in each of those sections. I suggest you to read that. And this is something that I already suggest you guys to read, uh, a book by Taylor Burroughs. So the next thing I would recommend all of you to do is to get familiarized with the different study designs, case reports, series, editorials, commentaries, and then you have original studies like uh, cross-sectional studies, cohort studies, case control studies, different types of reviews, narrative scoping, systematic meta-analysis. So these different, uh, what do they mean? Like how are they conducted? So very important for you to understand uh, what they mean. And it's basics of research. You can't proceed without knowing what they are and how they are uh, conducted. There's this uh, Substack, uh, it's a platform for writing by Asad Naveen. Uh, so he writes brilliant articles. I would recommend you guys to go and read up, read them up. Statistics, uh, it's a very useful skill set. And I feel that, you know, it's, it's not something, it's not a compulsion to learn statistics, but I feel whenever you uh, are aware of statistics, at least basic statistics, right? It sets your bar high. It augments your level of understanding of the analysis involved in the study and you feel that you have a, a grasp over the paper you understand papers uh, at a different level actually and uh, i would at least uh, recommend you guys to learn basic statistics at least so what what does this mean understand what are the different types of data ordinal continuous and what are the different types of distributions or t distributions z distributions uh, what are the commonly used parametric non parametric tests uh, t test anova chi square pearson spearman correlations uh, Wilcoxon tests. And what do uh, things like odds ratios, risk ratios, hazard ratios mean? So it's very important that you understand these things. This is the basics of research. And, uh, you know, you don't have to learn advanced statistics, right? I mean, you can consider learning regression and how, how to generate forest plots and all that for meta analysis. But, you know, what is more important is you learn basic statistics first. So this will help you even understand. Uh, what has happened behind the scenes uh, when it comes to analysis in any research paper. Next, coming to a, a, a question that's asked by many people actually, like how do I come up with a research question? It's, it's uh, very hard actually, and it's something we all have faced, right? So 
from what i have understood it always comes with experience it does come with experience and how do you start off with research you begin with collaborating with experts in the field with your mentors maybe your friends who have more experience than you so this is how you understand how topics are uh, how they're drafted how they're made so you need to discuss you need to brainstorm new ideas with people every now and then so they will uh, tell you whether it is feasible or not so it it takes time to be able to you know determine the feasibility of an idea and it's a knack that it develops eventually right so people who are in the field people who know how research works they know that uh, they know if a study idea that you have whether it's feasible or not and it's something that you will eventually develop with time what is a, re a good research question it should be something that's clear concise and specific it should focus on a particular topic it should be answerable through research that is it should be feasible right and it should be relevant it should be important and it should be interesting and uh, those are the things uh, i mean th these are the elements and those things were also iterated in this paper by uh, matic okay and this was a uh, it's an interesting paper i uh, recommend you guys to read it these are the elements that are uh, part of any uh, research question the relevance originality and rigor now originality is something uh, originality or novelty it's something that people struggle with because uh, it's difficult for people to come up with ideas that are novel and that haven't been done before but please understand that more than novelty i mean yes novelty does matter because at the end of the day you want your studies to get published but when it comes to original studies right uh you can always come up with a replication study you can come up with an updated meta analysis so these are things that that are published right and whenever we do let's say a meta analysis we we include many original studies which have the same research question which have homogeneous outcomes and they have done pretty much the same thing right you are also adding something to the literature let's say your study has been done somewhere else in some other population you can do it in your country it might or might not yield different results but definitely it is something that will add to literature right so don't be too bothered about originality or novelty although it is something that matters but you know when it comes to original research it's something that you shouldn't be too much bothered about next coming to uh, publishing your paper it's always important to choose an appropriate journal and uh, make sure you identify predatory journals so like um, let's say you publish a single paper it's quite likely that your email uh, will be your inbox will be filled with spam uh, from spam emails from different kinds of predatory publishers saying you publish with us you present with us and so on and so forth it's very important to identify them because uh, there are many lists actually there there's one in famous list uh, you might have heard bial's list and there are other lists cabell's list and so on so there's this paper you can uh, read them up uh, read this paper up and it explains how to identify um, a predatory journal it's always important to avoid these especially during the initial phase of your uh, career because it's very easy to get distracted and submit your papers here to just uh, uh, publish them for the sake of it and get a doi that's not important because uh, trust me i mean uh, these are uh, seen as a black mark in your uh, career uh, in the long run eventually you'll uh, look back and you'll regret this so always choose a journal that is indexed uh, i'm speaking with a priority order so it should be indexed it should be indexed in pubmed embase any uh, non database it should have a decent impact factor uh, search what an impact factor is search what an h index is learn what these uh, parametric parametrics are for a journal and always choose a journal which has a decent impact factor preferably more than one right and always uh, i mean prefer a journal that is open access because that would mean that anyone can access it and read it and you might end up receiving more citations in the long run uh, although you know it's not required but you know consider these things before you submit it to any journal go through every single guideline of the journal before submitting it uh, format your paper accordingly and sort out references and please make sure that you don't do it manually even to this date i says they manually sort out references one one reference they put uh, they pick up and they uh, individually try to convert it into different styles using certain websites it's ridiculous because you have certain uh, let's say you have a review with 40 to 50 references and you uh, put yourself through the pain of uh, citing every single study with a particular referencing style and then you want to switch the journal now you can't sit and do that for like 50 references so please learn to use softwares they're very easy to use there's zotero and note mendeley hardly it'll take 5 10 minutes to um acquaint yourself with the user interface you can watch videos on youtube or anywhere 
uh, it's quite self explanatory in fact you just have to explore the software for uh, like 10 15 minutes you'll understand how it works and please consider learning them and one more thing is to uh, make efforts to include experts in the field as authors in the study so this is something i'm telling out of experience because uh, preferably as a corresponding author in fact so please invite experts in the field it could be uh, people from uh, departments in your college it could be professors invite them to review your paper to go through it and submit it as a corresponding author because uh, that's how the academy works right especially let's say you write a narrative review narrative reviews are mostly solicited in nature no journal would want to accept a narrative review from a person who's not an expert in the field so um, to improve your chances of publication to uh, add more value to your manuscript um, please consider adding an expert in the field as an author some more insights that i'd like to share uh, before i end my talk is relentless and persistent efforts is the key because what i've seen is that uh, there are like many people hundreds of people who approach mentors on a daily basis saying that i'm interested in research what do i do so what what do we do when, what do i do when someone approaches me i give them, give them clear cut instructions okay these are the skills exactly what i explained today these are the skills you need to develop you have to learn how to write scientifically you have to learn uh, the different study designs you have to learn uh, maybe basic statistics you have to familiarize yourself with uh, softwares like zotero so these are basic skills that you need to develop as a researcher but efforts is the key it's very easy to uh, get interested all of a sudden um, one day be like i want to do research but it's only those who um, put in persistent efforts uh, and who are consistent are the ones who actually end up publishing something and who reach a stage in their life it comes to research and please try to come out of the um, i have no clue i have no idea phase understand that it is normal uh, to feel this way it is all right it's perfectly fine but it's it's okay in the initial phase but it's not okay to dwell in it forever there are people who have approached me one or two years back who were interested in research and to, even to this date they're just interested in research that's it they're not actually gone ahead and done any kind of work so it is important to put in efforts to understand how research works and how to actually do research and please consider finding a mentor it's very important i had great mentors uh, who helped me understand what research is who have given me opportunities and who have uh, who have had a great contribution to who i am today so this is where i'd like to end my talk you can uh, reach out to me on my email or linkedin and if there are any question and answers i'd love to take them if there are any questions i mean i'd love to take them thank you so much uh, for the wonderful session uh, very informative indeed uh, we do have some questions for you uh, so the first one is uh, how does one find a good research guide okay so identifying a research guide comes first from identifying what your field of interest is few people are uh, attracted to let's say neurology or cardiology nephrology pulmonology so you identify even if you're not able to identify that at least identify whether you're interested in medicine or research it's, these are very broad and it's very easy to know what you're interested in then what you do is you identify people who are who are closely uh, who you can contact closely for instance it could be a professor it could be a senior who has published in that field right it could be some professor from that department let's say you're interested in neuro neurology so you might find professors who are into research in the department of your college approach them tell them you are interested in research please guide me please mentor me because typically what happens is all indian colleges all indian universities they have residents who work on different theses they get published they have to get published actually so they hand over those projects they involve you in those projects so this is first hand research experience right so um, what i would recommend you is to first understand what field of uh, uh, in, what is your field of interest identify people who are researching in that field of interest who have published a lot go and explore research gate or go and explore their profiles in google scholar and drop them an email if let's say you're, you want to approach someone who is not in your university who maybe was in another country for that matter drop them an email email uh, and consider attaching your cv as well emailing people is the most important thing actually and um, yeah this is how you approach mentors actually and very rarely don't get disappointed it's very hard to i mean the response rates are very less because everyone's busy in their lives but don't uh, give up actually because finding a good mentor it will go a long way true thank you 
uh, so our next question is uh, can we publish research solo uh, without any guide and if yes uh, what about apcs okay research solo so see research actually the concept of research research solo is not recommended and it's not promoted anywhere actually because good research always comes with collaboration it does come with collaboration you need to identify people who you would want to work with many of times you might might not find interested batchmates you might find people who are interested in other colleges try to make a group try to network with people identify research teams to work with because uh, publishing solo is something i would not recommend unless you are writing an editorial right editorials or maybe commentaries viewpoints these are something that can be written solo but always consider working in teams it's always good to work in teams and you know wonders happen happen when you work with teams you know wonders like you know systematic reviews meta analysis they can't be done alone even guidelines from cochrane say you can't have one person publishing it you need at least two people and in fact most systematic reviews and meta analysis have at least 5 6 7 8 people so i wouldn't recommend publishing it solo and yeah, about apc so that's a different topic altogether there are different ways to uh, counter apc one is to of course uh, try and choose a journal which has no apc but then let's say it does now most journals actually they take apc for open access you uh, don't have to publish open access you can publish it uh, on a subscription based model and the, the other option is to actually some people invite authors to review their papers and also contribute uh, to the finances of the paper so that's maybe one other option or maybe there are uh, certain if in case you're fortunate enough to have uh, authors in your uh, team who are from nations where um, apcs are waived so you can include uh, them as you can consider them to be your uh, corresponding author and uh, in that case the apc would be waived understood i actually have a question a uh, follow up question for your answer supposingly if someone is in a situation where they don't have a lot of seniors to guide them and they're not able to get a grasp of their professors uh, yeah. how would they collaborate with other students uh, maybe from other colleges in the country uh, what would be an appropriate um, way to connect with such interest interested students okay. according to you hmm. yeah this is a uh, it's a genuine problem i know everyone i mean many people face this and so identify see there are uh, social media networks right and the best to uh, to actually consider is linkedin you can find people who are publishing every now and then in fact you have many student organizations now i won't be naming any you're all aware of them uh, you can actually enroll in them you can involve in research and you can also approach people on let's say you can email people right you can even message them you can drop in a message on linkedin saying i'm impressed with your works i i've read your works i want to learn from you so it's as simple as that right and um, I, I think this is the best way you can actually reach out, and the most important point is to actually reach out, you know, and not get disappointed that you don't have people in your vicinity who are interested in research. Things don't work in our way; our environment is not in our control. But uh, you should be proactive enough to explore and find people in networks such as LinkedIn and Twitter, and email them and get in touch with them. Got it. Thank you. Our next question is: uh, Someone is asking, sir, I'm writing a research manuscript. How do I do a plagiarism plagiarism check? Are there any good platforms which are free? Uh, so uh, plagiarism is a different topic, but yeah, plagiarism is something you'll have to check, especially if you're unsure of whether you uh, the similarity index is high or not in your paper. Industry standard is all I recommend. Authenticate uh, is industry standard. Turn it in. Basically, the same thing. uh the free ones i don't recommend at all there are many grammarly premium and here and there and these these one you know they're not recommended they're not used by journal editors by themselves so uh i would consider actually using uh authenticate or turn it in the free ones i am not aware of free ones i don't use free ones i don't recommend you to use free ones either uh you can get in touch with people who have access to authenticate who have access there are some services online which provide it uh for uh, a cost you can consider that as well but please don't uh, uh rely on free plagiarism checkers okay sir uh the next question is uh, someone is writing i'm a first year mbbs student i just entered a medical college i don't know that much about medical stuff how do i start research so first year is not a, a year where you should be starting a uh, research you can involve you can collaborate you can involve in let's say i i myself uh 
the only thing i did in, in first year was to acquaint myself with research understand the different technicalities involved behind research and i also enrolled myself in a multi centric international uh, study where i just did data collection because you know data collection is not something that you need expertise in so try to involve yourself in research right uh, but don't initiate research you're not in a stage where you can initiate a research paper and write it because you don't have knowledge like you mentioned already so this is a time where you learn this is the time where you understand how research is done and this is the time you actually also um, look out for mentors right it's this is the initial phase of your uh, career so you don't start off by uh, starting i mean initiating research projects in final year uh, ideally maybe second year or third year it makes more sense understood i have one last question for you uh, yeah. you mentioned about a multi centric research study uh, for first year students or anybody that wants to get started uh, how did your journey begin or how does one approach a situation like this if one is interested so um, i i'll just give you what happened in my situation so i uh, i my mentor was in was one of my seniors and uh, he made sure that our institution was in uh, it had enroll itself in a multi centric study and neuro is something i was interested in and you know, like i said you need to identify your field of interest you will find people and uh, make sure that you know you are in touch with uh, uh, your your you keep a tab of all research multi centric studies that are happening all over the world for instance uh, in like in my case in neurosurgery there was uh, the gns study there was gnos study that's ongoing so these studies are uh, initiated by mostly us universities and they make it multi centric in nature where you need to um pursue your university your college your department to enroll in that study and do some kind of data collection because what happens is uh, once you involve in it you understand how research works to some extent and you learn how to operate platforms like redcap or uh, uh, orion and uh, you feed data you understand how data is collected and after that you also end up getting uh, authorship uh, it's a collaborative authorship model where hundreds of authors are involved all over the world and they usually get uh, published in big journals like lancet so uh, what i would recommend you to do is to actually uh, first determine your field of interest and then follow um, different universities different university handles different research teams labs on twitter they keep announcing different multi centric studies uh you need to pursue your college department your professors to enroll in them become a part of the research team that's collecting data and upload data and that's how you learn all right uh and we have one last question uh what are the different approaches to data collection approaches to data collection no that that's something that completely depends on the type of study uh uh you're wanting to uh, conduct so let's say you it's a survey based research so data collection can be done online you can just send the survey to as many people as you want and then you have uh, data collection patient data collection where you go to the wards you check uh, the clinical parameters in el electronic health records and uh, sometimes you don't even have to go to the wards you can just ask the if you have a, a hospital system in your college which has uh, uh, which maintains a database of different patients and its data and their data you can actually just uh, ask them to provide you with the patient details from uh, if you have to provide them with parameters like i want all patient patients with x disease admitted from x time to y time i want all the patients so they'll hand over the excel sheet to you and this is basically data that's already collected you just have to analyze it it's retrospective in nature so it, approaches to data collection it completely depends on what kind of study you want to do understood So that's all for the questions that we have. Thank you so much. Uh, truly an amazing session. It was very refreshing to see you talk about uh, the art of writing the research paper rather than completely relying on AI or Chat GPT for research. How people are uh, promoting these days. Right. So wonderful session in my opinion. Thank you so so much for your time. Uh, I'd like to invite uh, Mr. Saurabh Kumar for his vote of thanks, sir. If you can take over. hello everyone and first and foremost i'd like to express my gratitude to our speaker mr vinay suresh for sharing his valuable ideas on research methods and also thanks to all the attendees as well who decided to join us sparing their time and showing interest so that they can contribute to healthcare research by learning 
some of the tips given by our speaker today. And lastly, I am grateful to our whole ThinkMate team, especially our moderator come joint secretary, Rudrakshi, who has handled so well this talk, and our president, Vavo Singh, whose efforts made, made this means wonderful event come true. And personally, I feel very connected because I was not aware um, about Mr. Vinayashwari's field of interest, and that was neurology, because uh, I had also started lately uh, in, in getting involved in researches, medical research, and I also uh, published two papers as a co-author related to field of neurology itself. So it was a, a quite impressive talk, and I personally felt very nice to be a part of this talk. And uh, yes, and that's enough. And on the closing note, uh, which is most important, actually, uh, attendees who are attending this session, uh, please get in touch with us for future sessions and many interesting events which are coming along the way, because we'll have many webinars and uh, many studies or quizzes organized by our ThinkMed team which will help you to pursue your interest, whether it is academic or healthcare research. And especially, I would like to mention a very important upcoming webinar, uh, which is directed towards uh, academic knowledge and research related to emergency medicine by one of renowned professors of KGMU itself. So please get tuned, stay connected with us on social media handles. And thank you, everyone for attending, for uh, making this a successful talk. That's it. Thank you.